Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to you all. Welcome to this digital dialogue on the future of women, peace and security. We have over 800 participants from all over the world, so a warm welcome to you all. I'm Claire Hutchinson, NATO Secretary General Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security, and your moderator for today. This month marks 20 years since the adoption of Resolution 1325. We're taking the opportunity on this anniversary to not only reflect on what has been achieved since 2000, but to look forward to where we need to go from here. That's what today's digital dialogue is all about. We have a great lineup of speakers, but to kick us off, I'd like to introduce NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. It, Secretary General, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Claire, and many thanks for your commitment and your leadership, and uh, thank you for organizing this event today. To mark the 20th uh, anniversary of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, and to look to the future of this agenda for uh, NATO. The resolution has had a profound impact worldwide. Uh, it changed the conversation about security and it changed NATO. Our ability to adapt uh, to change is key to our success. As a modern, agile and inclusive organization, we keep all our people safe. Now we are adapting once more to a complex and challenging security landscape. This is why I launched a forward-looking reflection on the future of NATO earlier this year. It is called NATO 2030. It is about making our strong alliance even stronger. My vision for NATO 2030 is based on three priorities. Making sure NATO stays strong militarily, becomes stronger politically, and takes a more global approach. I believe that our efforts on women, peace and security have an important contribution to make to each of these areas. First, when it comes to staying strong militarily. Our armed forces need the best and the brightest. We cannot afford to overlook the skills of half of our population. Whether they are going to be pilots or sailors, engineers or cyber experts. So women have an important role to play in national defense. For decades, NATO has worked to reduce barriers to women in military. Today, the percentage of women in allied armed forces is 12%. This is a very low number, but it is double of what it was 20 years ago. I urge all allies to recruit more women in their military, because the more diverse and gender equal our armed forces are, the better they perform, and the more operationally effective we are as an alliance. Diverse armed forces are strong armed forces. But of course, this is not all about numbers. The women and men in uniform are also being trained to apply a gender lens to everything they do. To training, our soldiers and commanders are more alert and receptive to everybody's need, needs. They can help to recognize, prevent and report acts of conflict-related sexual violence and they can better take into account the impact that military operations can have on local populations, including women. Not least by deploying gender advisors as we do in NATO. This is not just about equality, it is also about security. Second, our efforts on women, peace and security make NATO stronger politically. When we bring different perspectives into the debate and listen to the voices of both men and women, we simply make better decisions. At NATO, the number of women at the decision-making table is slowly, 
but steadily increasing. <clears throat> Eight ambassadors are women, and seven defense ministers are women, including Minister Sekerinska Radmila, who is joining us today, and who is a great example of political courage and expertise. There is strength in diversity, but again, this is not and cannot be about numbers alone. To make better decisions, we also need to understand that the challenges we face and our response to them can affect women and men differently. This is a reality we should not ignore. We know, for example, that women are the main victims of conflict-related sexual violence. And research shows that they are more likely than men to be cyberbullied. We also know that in allied countries, 70% of the healthcare workers are women. They are on the front line dealing with COVID-19. So when we talk about security issues, from military attacks to hybrid attacks or even pandemics, we need to recognize who they affect and how. This is vital to shape solutions that will serve everyone. What we advocate inside our alliance, we also advocate elsewhere, including in countries where we have active operations. That is why NATO supports the Afghan peace talks, where women have a strong voice in the government delegation and where it is important to safeguard the gains made in the last decades, not least for women and girls. Because there can be no peace unless there is peace for all. In Iraq, where the commander of our mission is a woman, uh, Jenny Kalinong, uh, we built the capacity of local security forces to make uh, their institutions more effective, inclusive and sustainable. And in uh, many of our partner countries, we have strengthened our training on human rights and the protection of civilians. Third, our efforts on women, peace and security take a global and cooperative approach. This benefits us all. Preserving our security and protecting the fundamental values on which the rules-based order is founded is a joint endeavor. NATO's 30 allies will continue to play their part to further advance gender equality. We are also sharing experience and building understanding with partners from around the world. From the United Nations to the African Union and from Georgia to Jordan and Sweden to New Zealand. With governments and with civil society organizations, we are working together to make a difference. We have made significant progress in the past. Now we must seize the opportunity in the future to further implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. You have my personal commitment to provide the leadership and support needed. I also look forward to hearing your views, your opinion on how we can collectively do more and do better. Because I'm convinced that advancing this agenda will make NATO even stronger and fit for the future, supporting peace and security for all. So thank you once again, and I wish you a very successful dialogue. Thank you, Secretary General. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your opening thoughts, uh, which are so important, and a reminder of how critical the work is before us today. I know you have a busy schedule and you have to go, but thank you again for joining us. Today, we're here to have a frank conversation about the future of women, peace and security generally. The most importantly for NATO. 20 years ago, the world was a very different place. And as you know, the adoption of the resolution changed the way we think about women's role in conflict and in peace. No longer, we thought, would women be relegated to the sidelines of the conversation on peace and security. We thought. For many, women, peace and security in NATO may not seem like a natural fit. However, 
This is part of our core business. And as Secretary General said, we are serious about making sure that women, peace and security is at the heart of all we do. Security is NATO's business. And this agenda is about security. So it should come as no surprise that the Alliance not only adopted the principles of women, peace and security and the agenda with it, but that we have changed significantly as a result. We've deployed gender advisors, adopted a zero tolerance policy on sexual exploitation abuse. We have more women than ever before working at NATO and we are integrating gender into all our work from intelligent requirements to defence capabilities. But as the world is changing, so is our alliance and so is the requirement for women, peace and security. What was relevant 20 years ago, we must ask today, is it still relevant? We face security challenges from climate change, energy, media disinformation and cyber security. We face challenges to women's participation in non-traditional areas. We have fragmentation of the agenda. Is parity coming at the expense of integration? And we're divided in our approaches as a global community that only derails the full implementation of this agenda. So, on this anniversary, we have the opportunity to revisit and revise. Women, peace and security needs a reboot. And that's what we're here to do today, to talk about what's next for women, peace and security at NATO and what we need to do to take this work forward. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Radmila Sharinska is the Minister of Defence of NATO's newest ally, North Macedonia. Minister Sharinska is the only woman in North Macedonia who has held the position of Minister of Defence and also the only woman to head any of the major political parties in the country. She was instrumental in the country's successful journey to join NATO and in shaping its candidacy to the EU. We're delighted to welcome the Minister to this conversation today. Minister, we have a question to you from the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association. Hello everyone, I'm Eugenia Joni, the President of Youth Atlantic Treaty Association. I'm glad to be part of this event and to make my question to this panel. As we all know, there has been a lot of research, empirical work and data collection on women, peace and security over the years. I would like to know how has this impacted defense planning and investments? How has this changed the protection of women and girls and the overall concept of what security means and looks like nowadays? And moreover, what has your nation done to implement this? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eugenia. Minister, over to you. Well, Claire, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And uh, I would like to personally thank the Secretary General for uh, not only ticking the boxes of being politically correct to honor this day, but for really supporting this agenda and for uh, also supporting the more vocal and visible presence of women uh, at all NATO uh, events. Uh, let, me, let me start by saying that I'm an engineer by profession. So even in my present life as a politician, I love when I'm able to do policy based on research and empirical data. And uh, uh, in spite of that, I'll have to say that my uh, or our work on women, peace and security uh, in, uh, in the Ministry of Defense was more intuitive than rational. Uh, why, you will ask, uh, and I have a very simple answer, because when I entered this ministry and I looked at the data, it was not only appalling, it was depressing. And once you start with such a, such a bad set of data, you actually have to put uh, a lot of energy and some enthusiasm based on your previous, ex previous experiences and not just on the data that keeps repeating itself. Um, uh, security is our business. This is what Claire said. And I fully agree that our security and our core business is better if we include the diversity. Uh, out of the three I's, the integration, the inclusiveness, and the integrity in the whole concept of women, peace, and security, I really believe that uh, inclusiveness is something that we need to remind ourselves uh, uh, constantly. Why? Because uh, actually 
none of the rights uh, that now women enjoy has ever been given. They were fought for and they have to be protected. And we cannot expect to exercise our rights without being present at the table, without being present on the meetings, without being uh, present and influential during negotiations. And this is why I think it is important that women are more and more present in NATO when discussing security challenges. And may I say, when discussing uh, different security challenges, let me tell you my personal example uh, that uh, took place just a few months ago uh, at the start of the corona pandemics. We have had um, a small group of security experts and some of the key ministers present on the table. And we were discussing, I will say, a big security risk. And this was the football match between Kosovo and North Macedonia, uh, because uh, there were some doubts and fears that this might be actually a security risk and especially a threat for some of the bilateral relations in the region, that it could be exploited by certain structures to steer uh, violence or hatred. And we were doing this while the virus was already present on European soil. I was surrounded by men, of course, as usual. And then I was the only one who asked the unthinkable question. And this was, are we sure that the football match will actually take place? And when I ask this question, having in mind the, the epidemics, uh, I have seen a very familiar uh, glare by some of the colleagues. Of course, you know, football matches have to be, <laughs> have to take place and there is no emergency that can avoid them. But it turned out that the diversity in that room helped us make an appropriate assessment and actually decide on the completely new security threat that completely overshadowed the, the danger of uh, violence during, during some hooligan gangs uh, uh, present here in Skopje. So that was my, the first comment that I wanted to make. We have to be on the table. And this is why uh, inclusiveness is actually the key thing that uh, I, I think we need to, to, to aspire. The second comment uh, I wanted to make was what, uh, how much did the situation change in the last 20 years? Uh, and I have to say that I'm not <laughs> that, that positive on the assessment. Uh, more or less 20 years ago, uh, uh, North Macedonia was going through a difficult ethnic conflict. We have had NATO, we have had the EU supporting us, and we have had peace talks that went on for almost a whole year. I was the only woman at the table. 17 years afterwards, 20, 2017, we have had a political crisis and I was again the only woman in the, in, uh, in the room and on the table. And I, I do believe that this reminds us that on many issues, we haven't gone uh, as boldly as we should have. I mentioned in the beginning that the numbers in the defense sector frightened me at the beginning of my, my mandate. I will say that the numbers are still low, not only according to, to my expectations, but according to an objective assessment. Uh, but as the general secretary said, 10% uh, that we have now is very small. But in the course of just two years, we have managed to triple the number of high, high ranking uh, female officers. In a period of three years, we have managed to increase the enrollment rate for girl, for young women at the military academy to 40%. And what we have seen also is an increase in our participation in emissions as well. So on one side, I do believe that uh, on the tables that matter, there are actually still too few women. And I think uh, I can only add our uh, Macedonian experience that actually having women in negotiations make the negotiations more, more likely to succeed and it makes them sustainable. The Oak Creek Peace Agreement that was signed uh, uh, 19 years ago uh, had many elements. All of them were difficult for implementation and all of them required a new set of negotiations on security, on disarmament, on political compromises. All of them were tricky and all were faced with opposition. And the only one that I can remember that actually worked from the beginning until the end and ran smoothly, both in terms of negotiations, but uh, also in terms of 
defending in, in front of the public was a piece of legislation referring to high education. And it was the only piece that was negotiated with two women on the table, each representing both sides. So I, I really believe that uh, uh, there, there, is a, there are quite enough examples and experiences that show how the table changes when you open up the possibility for women participation. And the third uh, and last comment that uh, I wanted to make uh, was of course that the absence uh, in defense of women stems from, from a general absence of women in our political life. So it's not something that we can tackle only in NATO or only in, uh, in defense, in peace and security. Uh, I was reminded of some uh, uh, global monitors that were uh, uh, analyzing the situation in, the, in global media back in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And they have noticed that women make up only 24% of the persons heard, read about, or seen on television, radio, and newspapers. And that this is exactly the same percentage as back in 2010. And this is actually the root cause for our, our absence, also on tables that discuss security. But I do believe that in the domain of security, we pay a much higher price. Uh, I have had, we have had actually an event two, two uh, days ago here in Skopje on uh, the first NAP that the Ministry of Defense uh, produced. And uh, we were there to celebrate our successes. Uh, I was there also to, to say very loudly to especially women in the military that I know that we are constantly tested more than some of our male colleagues. I felt the same tests the first time I went for a military exercise. Will she enter the helicopter? Will she go closer to the field? Will she be interested in these things? I was tested the second time when uh, I was invited to, to visit our soldiers in Kabul. For five years, some of my former colleagues, ministers of defense on all men, decided not to pay a visit, but I knew that my no will have a completely different significance. So uh, I, I, I try to, to share the burden of the many brave women in the military because actually their role is even more difficult. I have gone through the political labyrinth, through the political uh, hurdles, and I was a bit more prepared for the defense domain. But for many of them who are not in leadership position, the start of the career sets too many barriers, sets too many glass ceilings. And I do believe that as a first minister of defense, it is my role really to help them fight. Um, I do believe that women can contribute a lot in defense and security. Uh, that's because this domain requires both discipline and consistency. We have to work a lot, we have to plan a lot, but we also have to help a lot. And I do believe that the future of uh, the resolution 1325 and the, the whole domain of women, peace and security really depends solely on the solidarity of the women in the sector and the support of the few good men. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll see more of it uh, in the future. I do hope, I do hope that our role is to make it a bit easier for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, and congratulations on that nap. And you've raised a lot of questions uh, for me. Uh, and uh, I'm reminded of that saying, when they don't offer you a seat at the table, then bring your own. So uh, next, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Ambassador Milan Vivier. Uh, an executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Ambassador Vivier was the first United States ambassador at large for global women's issues and currently serves as executive director of Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace and Security, which just published the first ever United States Women, Peace and Security Index. A distinguished public servant devoted to investing in emerging women leaders, developing sustainable gender frameworks and examining the crucial role women play in peace building and security. And Milan is also a great friend to NATO. Milan, it's wonderful to have you with us today. And we have a question to you from the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. 
Hi, my name is Sofia Shevchuk and I currently work as the research assistant at the NATO Parliamentary Assembly as well as I'm actively engaged with Vice Brussels and Brussels Binder. My question to the today's panels is as follows. Earlier this year, NATO decided to rethink its preparedness for the new security risks such as climate change, hybrid threats and health security. As it is conceptualizing the new vision for 2030, Women, peace and security agenda should not be an ads on it, but rather be incorporated in the whole reflection process. So how can women, peace and security agenda be updated and integrated in NATO's future as it reflects these new security risks? Thank you. Thank you. And Milan, please, your thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Claire. It's very good to be with you and... Uh, the others who have joined this discussion today, and I'm particularly delighted as someone who works at a university to have the young people, uh, our future, so engaged in this conversation. Um, I also want to thank the minister uh, for her wonderful comments, and uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with both the challenges that you laid out, but the personal uh, steps that you see uh, enabling a progress to be made in the space that you yourself occupy. I believe that these times call for us to think anew and act anew. And it is encouraging to see that NATO on this 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 is taking that challenge seriously, both in its current application of the resolution uh, and as the questioner so ably asked, the new threats that we confront. And I think we do need a reappraisal in the way we address ending conflicts and building sustainable peace. Because despite the good intentions of Security Council Resolution 1325, women are still too often being marginalized. We still have not truly applied this imperative uh, in peace processes and negotiations, as the minister pointed out, in post-conflict decision-making, uh, in relief and recovery and reconstruction, those areas at that moment of transition that are so critical uh, in going forward uh, with the creation of the potential for sustainable peace and what that represents uh, in terms of economic, viability in terms of building institutions, uh, in terms of uh, all the aspects of security reform uh, that are required. So we have much to do in reapplying and reassessing how 1325 uh, affects our work. Uh, and I loved what our interlocutor, our youth interlocutor just said. Um, about this not being an add-on. I could not agree more. Uh, this is not an add-on. The WPS agenda must be fully integrated uh, into every aspect of NATO decision-making. In all the ways that the Secretary General just laid out, uh, the, the political aspects, the military aspects, uh, and the work that happens on the global level. Uh, so this gendered approach to peace building can no longer be just an option. Uh, it has to incorporate all that, be incorporated in all that we do. Uh, and we know that today we have a plethora of data. We have an evidence-based case that grows by the hour that demonstrates the effectiveness of applying a gender lens both to conventional and to new threats to the whole comprehensive security agenda. And there is a strong link between the women, peace and security framework and addressing those new threats uh, in the preparedness question that our youth interlocutor just put before us. Let me just go through a few of those threats and what they represent in terms of a gender analysis. First, COVID. This COVID pandemic should be a wake-up call for all of us.
because it has accelerated security threats the world over. No place has been spared by the contagion. It has also exposed deep inequalities in societies. Women have been disproportionately affected and they continue to be, as the Secretary General said, over 70% of healthcare workers, the first humanitarian responders, especially in conflict zones where women peace builders have been a lifeline to their communities. They've also suffered extreme economic dislocation and their security has been severely undermined as violence against women has dramatically increased as a result of COVID. If we do not understand the gendered aspects of the COVID crisis and apply a gender lens to relief and recovery in our great response that will have to be made, we will have learned little from this crisis. Yet women's organizations are being excluded as we are here meeting in COVID response decision-making and recovery planning at all levels. Even as they are working to reduce tensions and stabilize their communities. The Women, Peace and Security framework therefore needs to be fully integrated into actions on the COVID response in building resilience for the future and addressing the humanitarian crises to come. Second, climate change. Climate is an existential threat. Uh, when we talk about new threats, it is an existential threat, the ultimate threat multiplier, a defining risk to peace and security in this 21st century. The Security Council in addressing women, peace and security recognized the nexus between gender, climate and conflict. Future conflicts and political tensions are likely to be exacerbated by vanishing natural resources, especially in some places as we're seeing already, water. Climate displacement is creating a whole new class of climate refugees and its impacts have already increased the insecurity of vulnerable communities in several regions around the globe and going with it hand in hand is political and economic instability that it brings with it. In fragile and conflict affected settings where governments is limited or ineffective, the consequences of climate change impact with other stresses compounds the existing tensions that can disrupt fragile peace processes or escalate into violence. Research conducted by our Institute at Georgetown on gender, climate and security makes clear the urgent need for gender responsive action to tackle these linked cases. Interventions around natural resources, the environment and climate change, for example, provide significant opportunities for women's political and economic leadership and strengthening their contribution to peace. And today women are playing a vital role in conflict prevention and sustainable inclusive peace on the front lines of climate change. So clearly again, the WPS framework should be integrated into actions addressing the terrible threat of climate change and all it represents. Third, let me touch on one other present and future threat in this time that I have. And that has to do with countering terrorism and violent extremism. The Security Council again in resolution 2242 that was added to Women, Peace and Security called on states to integrate gender as a cross cutting issue in developing strategies to counter terrorism and violent extremism, and to ensure the participation and leadership of women and their organizations in countering this threat. 
Men and women are differently impacted. Terrorist groups have targeted women and perpetrated crimes of sexual violence against them. Women are victims of terrorism. And yet terrorists have also radicalized and attracted women to their cause, including some in the West. Women are engaged both in countering and promoting violent extremism. And this reality must be understood if we're going to address the threat that this poses. Efforts to prevent and counter violent extremism can't be focused solely on military solutions. Women in their families, acting through organizations in their communities, are often the early warning in identifying and preventing radicalization. They identify the security concerns. They can be critical interlocutors between government institutions and law enforcement and their communities. So an investment in women's meaningful inclusion in countering violent extremism and that can lead to terrorism is critical for our consideration. Because here too, the framework of a gender lens, the framework of women, peace and security needs to be integrated into the threat that terrorism poses. Gender analysis is important to ensuring that the best strategies are adopted. That's what it's all about, to be effective in ensuring peace and security. And the treatment of women is a barometer for present and future instability, violence, and security. The Women, Peace, and Security Index developed by our Georgetown Institute Claire alluded to the US index that we published a few days ago, focusing on the United States. But the global index uh, that we have done in the past with the Peace Research Institute of Oslo takes into consideration three dimensions that affect the well being of women inclusion, security, and justice. And what it shows is a direct correlation between the well being of women, their security, their agency, and the well being of nations. Where violence is pervasive and rights are denied, those places are threats to overall security. In other words, there's a straight line between violence against women, oppression, and conflict. So, women's full and equal and meaningful participation are at the core of conflict resolution, prevention and recovery efforts, as well as addressing the new threats for which we need to be prepared. NATO has taken the UN Security Council's imperative seriously. Our gathering today is another demonstration of that. And it has a commitment in this sphere to integration, to inclusion, and to integrity. And for over 70 years, this security alliance has made an enormous difference. And in these times of complex challenges, compounded by these new threats, we can be confident that NATO will continue to do so. We know that fully integrating a gender lens as put forward in the women's security framework will serve to enhance the Alliance's effectiveness and its preparedness for these new threats. And I will end there. Thank you so much, Milan. You've raised so many points that, that reinforce the work that we're doing. Uh, moving away from the add women and stir perspective into getting a gender perspective right at the heart of security. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And we're trying to open this conversation because unless, as you've rightly said, we have this gender lens, we're missing uh, at our peril 
a lot of the security dynamics. And uh, and is this where we need to be in the future with women, peace and security? I know you have your own event, so I, I am so grateful that you give us this time to join us uh, and that you have to leave. But thank you again, and hopefully we see you soon. So now I'd like to introduce Do Dr. Robert Egnell, who is the Vice Chancellor of the Swedish Defence University. Dr. Egnell also serves as Senior Fellow with the Security Studies Programme at Georgetown University and as a Captain in the Swedish Army Reserves with operational experience from the 1st Swedish Battalion in Kosovo. Dr. Egnell's extensive study in the conduct and effectiveness of peace and stability operations, gender and military operations, and women in combat will greatly contribute to this conversation. Robert, we have a question to you from Elena, who is a mentee with the US-based organization, Girl Security. Hi, my name is Elena. I'm a Girl Security mentee and a high school junior from Virginia and the United States. My question for the panel is, where women are deployed, it is often seen as enhancing mission or operation success. Still, there are arguments against women's deployment. Can women's contributions enhance or reshape the type of capabilities required as part of deployment? How will women's contributions become even more vital to international peace and security as the nature of conflict changes? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. And so I think, Robert, you are primed to answer this. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be uh, part of this discussion. Uh, but also to Elena for, for a couple of really excellent, but also challenging questions. Um, the, the short answer is yes, uh, women's contribution can have an impact on effectiveness. And I can give you all kinds of examples uh, where, where they can increase the quality of intelligence gathering, enhancing situational awareness, uh, um, providing security by, by body searches, searching women's accommodation in, in cultures where, where it would be inappropriate for men to do that job, um, but also in protecting civilians and, and what have you. Uh, but I, I would really like to unpack that question a little bit because it is a bit of a trap. Um, first of all, why are we even asking if women can make a contribution? Uh, how often have we asked, do men make a contribution to military operations? Uh, and if not, why not, so to speak? So, so we have to be careful. Uh, it, it makes an assumption that, that they wouldn't for some, for some reason, right? The other challenge of, of, of that question and my answer is that it tends to essentialize women's capabilities to certain areas. And, and, and we would then say, well, women are, are perhaps more diplomatic, more better listeners, they can address women within the field and therefore improve intelligence gathering and what have you. And that is rather dangerous. And, and most of the women I, I, I meet in the armed forces, they haven't joined uh, to, to, to play a certain femi feminine role within, within that unit, but rather to do the job as, as any, any other one would do. And, and um, so, so, so it does require a little bit of unpacking. It, another challenge is that we, when we ask the question that way, what role can women play uh, or, or how can they improve operational effectiveness? Um, we tend to, to, um, to assume that women will have a natural impact on an organization. And there's quite a lot of research highlighting that they will not unless the organization also really works on, on their approaches to gender, to inclusiveness. Uh, so adding women and stirring is, is, has a rather limited impact unless the organization is really willing to integrate and not just assimilate uh, uh, women. And, and that means changing culturally. Uh, so introducing a gender perspective on the organization and its operation is just as important as adding women, so to speak. On the other hand, um, Asking these types of questions uh, is what I do most. Uh, and, and the question is, why, why do we then have to focus on these operational effectiveness issues so much? Why, why are we so keen on you know, trying to understand what kind of an impact women would have? Well, first of all, it's for me, um, because quite often I, I work with rather reluctant organizations, uh, the military, 
banking sectors, the justice system, for example. And unfortunately, the rights-based arguments that, you know, that would lead to not even asking the question, what, what would women contribute? Uh, it's not enough because the, uh, the argument is, well, you know, women's rights, it's, it's hugely important and, and we salute you for addressing it, but you have to understand we're in the business of war. And it's just too important to be politically correct about these things. Uh, so go ahead, address these issues, promote women's equality, but, but it's not for us, thank you very much. Um, so that means I have to work on these rather instrumental operational effectiveness issues in order to really have an impact with that argument. I have to show that, and it, it, it also uh, uh, is important for another reason, and that is, it's clearly not uh, most military organizations task to improve uh, gender equality in society. There are much better placed organizations for that task. Uh, they can play a small role obviously, but their main task is to, to defend the nation by, by fighting and winning the nation's wars as I believe the US Army website says. And that means I have to be able to explain why gender perspectives and why increased women's participation is important to their task. Otherwise, they will not be very interested in, in my arguments. And that means making much more simplistic arguments and instru instrumental ones. Let me show you how to win the next war. Let me show you how to make more money, uh, for example, in the banking sector. And suddenly I, I catch their interest. And while I have it, it, there's an opportunity to talk about other issues that are, are more rights-based and, and, and more nuanced than those rather simplistic arguments. Uh, so uh, there's a simple answer, and that is, yes, women can make a great impact on both the, the culture of the organization and the way they do their business, uh, but we have to be careful here uh, with that argument as well uh, and, and more nuanced. The second part of the question, very quickly, uh, given the, the changing nature of, of, of conflict, and uh, can, can women make an even greater impact? And, and again, um, this is a difficult one to do briefly. Uh, we are obviously facing um, a wide variety of security challenges these days. So rather than just talk about the changing nature of conflict, let's talk about the security issues that we are facing. And, and, and Ambassador Vivia talked about a number of them, but, but radicalization and terror, climate change, international crime, uh, uh, pandemics, obviously, uh, migration uh, uh, that can have an impact as well, uh, scarcity uh, over resources. There are any number of, of issues where traditional security concepts sort of fail in addressing these issues. And, and for me, human security approaches, but also gender, the gender lens on security issues is something that, that, that helps me understand these issues and how we as societies can address them. Inclusivity and gender perspectives, women's participation are hugely important in, in understanding these problems. In, in addressing them and making good policy, but also in planning and executing operation in relation to these issues. So, so this is not just a military matter. It's, it's about all the security challenges that we are facing that do require inclusive gender equal uh, organizations that, that can see things in, in, in a bigger picture, so to speak. I think I'll stop there to allow time for, for the rest of the speakers as well. But thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, and it raises uh, the question for me about operational effectiveness and is there a connection, is there a risk to essentialize women when we talk about operational effectiveness and, and you know we could talk about this for, for a long time. So we're raising lots of questions here. I have my own questions about the, the connection to human security, but uh, I'm going to move on very quickly to our next uh, speaker who is Christina Luntz. Uh, co-founder and co-executive director for the Centre for F Feminist Foreign Policy. Christina leads the wor world's first London and Berlin-based research and advocacy organisation, promoting an intersectional, feminist and people-centred approach to foreign policy. An award-winning human rights advocate, Forbes 30 Under 30 honoree and a fierce champion for the construction of global feminist networks and advancement of all women. 
Christina, thank you for joining us. And we have a question for you from Johannes Voltri, an intern here at NATO. Hello, my name is Johannes Voltri and I'm actually currently an intern here at NATO. And I also have a question. And the question I would like to ask is that in this division between military and militarization, can there be a feminist foreign policy? And can this feminist foreign policy lend itself to a feminist defense policy? Uh, why or why not? Thank you. And that is a great question. Okay, Christina, what do you think? Thank you so much, Claire. Such a huge pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel here. Um, and what an excellent question indeed. Um, such a huge question that I spent a little bit of time thinking about the response. Um, and I would like um, to first acknowledge that the, the following, following that I'll be um, saying that is also based on very great feminist thinkers, including Madeleine Rees and Ray Atchison, Beatrice Finn, Valerie Hudson, Sanam Andalini, Cynthia Enlow and others. So the quick, um, the quick response is that under the current terms of defense and security, a feminist defense policy is not imaginable. To understand this, we need a historic understanding of how societies have developed and built its institutions and systems, including policies. We live in a patriarchal society and that for thousands of years has relied on the oppression of women and other political minorities. And this oppression has been sustained through all forms of violence. Research by Hudson et al. shows that this first political order, i.e. the oppression of women um, in marriage and in the home has led to the oppression of other groups of society and as long as this oppression is secured through force and the threat to use force continues, states and societies around the world will be fragile and sustainable peace will never be possible. This patriarchal world order has created systems of domination, domination and our current militaries, security and defense policies need, need to be understood as a result of this patriarchal worldview, which is why feminism, which aims to smash patriarchy, cannot be compatible with current defense policy. And which is why WPS, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, in its origin, a radical feminist agenda, cannot be compatible with current defense policy neither. And, and here I quote Ray Atchison, nuclear weapons are arguably the most extreme expression of violence and control of the patriarchal, racist and capitalist world order. They are the pinnacle of a state's monopoly on violence, the ultimate signifier of domination. Feminist intellectuals and change makers demand that security is not understood as the capability to, to destroy and kill from a state's perspective, but to enhance the well-being and safety of individuals. In 2019, the nine nuclear armed states spent nearly 73 billion on their nuclear weapon systems. This comes to almost 140k dollars spent on nuclear weapons per minute. ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, earlier this year during the pandemic um, calculated for the P5, how many hundreds and thousands of intensive care beds and ventilators and doctors and nurses this money could finance. So to summarize, as long as defense stems from the patriarchal logic of possessing the ability to destroy and knowing that militarized responses are useless given the dangers that we are facing, such as pandemics and the climate catastrophe, and knowing that nuclear weapons, part of such militarized response, are a product of racism, colonialism, think of where most of the testing has been taking place, and patriarchy, and knowing that such pro product never has and never will keep anyone safe, let me repeat, there cannot be a feminist defense policy and security policy if they entail those elements. However, and this is good news, systems and institutions can be transformed if they're really willing to. Especially according to NATO 2030, NATO is about keeping us safe. But there's no other thing that could keep an entire world less safe than domination and nuclear weapons. So 
how do we get from this reality to a world where a feminist defense policy is possible? And what does such feminist defense, feminist defense policy include? To transform, we need a transitional phase that according to intellectuals such as Madeleine Rees, is sequenced in the same way that a peace process is. The transition from this current reality to a world where defense, feminist defense policy is possible requires confidence building measures. And similar to peace processes, start with DDR measures, i.e. divesting out of arms, starting with nuclear, and resulting in support for alternative economic activities based on feminist political economy. So concrete steps of how NATO can contribute to the possibility of feminist defense policy are the following. First, get to the point, get to the pain points such as the nuclear planning group. According to NATO policy, and here I quote, the alliance's nuclear policy is kept under constant review and is modified and adapted in light of new developments. It is now the right time to include feminists and those with system changing expertise in the planning group for ultimate long-term change. Second, never lose sight of the radical feminist origins of the WPS agenda. Because the WPS agenda is supposed to be a feminist transformational agenda and not a adding women to existing militarized structures agenda. Third, make prevention, which is a key pillar of WPS, but the most neglected one, a priority. And by prevention, the mothers of the WPS meant prevention of conflict, not the prevention of certain forms of violence within conflict. Fourth, advocate for peace ministries everywhere and prioritize collaborating with them. Fifth, Understand security as people's well being and safety, and defense as safeguarding people from real threats. As such, align NATO's priorities with the six principles for sustainable development, as articulated by a feminist consortium, including Madre and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And those six principles that NATO should make priority are working towards ceasefires stopping gender-based violence, improving health, saving the environment, and prioritizing disarmament and redefining security. Sixth, never forget, and that is really important, a truly feminist defense policy negates the nation state as the subject of attention and places people, species, and planet at its core. And lastly, a feminist, defense po a feminist defense policy builds on the concept of international cooperation to address, to address the crises we face, that is climate catastrophe, pandemics, racism, and everyday violence. So the traditional understanding of security and defense is not one imagined and institutionalized by political minorities whose interests feminists are fighting for, but there's the chance to reclaim the terms of defense and security. If NATO is being serious about its NATO 2030 process, change will be possible towards the feminist defense policy. So, and whilst it's regrettable that feminists, women and other political minorities have to use their energy and their resources to fix a system that they never built, they never wanted and they suffer from, it is exactly those groups who are experts in building a society and world order that actually works for all and, and that can support organizations, including NATO, to contribute to such society. NATO has already gone through remarkable changes by widening the understanding of what security means or by including the special representative on women, peace and security, just don't stop there and go much, much further. A task force of feminist practitioners and feminist intellectuals could help. And I'd actually have some recommendations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christina. Well, that certainly opened a lot of questions. And uh, and I'm actually going to, uh, in a way, disagree about the feminist, uh, the angle of feminism, because I don't believe that the peace activism has the ownership of feminism. I believe that we are all feminists, our Secretary General, to myself, to everybody, uh, that works on women's empowerment and equality are feminists. And so I think what we have to start doing as we look towards the future of women, peace and security, is redefining what does that mean? And can we have a feminist defence policy? Yeah, because that is about putting in the, the agency of women vis-a-vis -vis equality and the conversation around security that is so important to us, not only here at NATO, but to everybody. And I think this is where the crux of this argument is. How do we align the different ideas of military and militarization with something that we look at as security. Um, and this is questions I'm obviously going to pose to you. We have a couple of questions that have come up, so I would like to uh, put these to the panel uh, collectively. I have a question from Fernando from Genderforce. Unfortunately, the video, we had a technical glitch, so I'm going to read the question. Uh, Fernando asks, the threats and violence against women peace builders, mediators, journalists, activists, as well as women's human rights defenders have increased over the last years. However, questions on women, peace and security overlooked or even absent. Why is that? And how can NATO or how can security be improved on women's security on the ground? And a second question, which is linked, uh, linked to this, and I, maybe uh, I could go back to Christina for this one. Giving gender equality is linked to economic growth. How can countries within the alliance pursuing gender equality, how can they align this with the 2% alliance requirement? So I'm actually going to open this question to Robert. Would you like to take a, a few words to that? Oh. Especially, I, I would like, really love to address the question of, of the, the, the feminist defense policy debate, if I may. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's such an important one um, because it, 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 you can either see it as an ideological question, uh, uh, but you can also see it as a strategic one. And, and I agree with you, Claire. We, we uh, who are working on these issues, including the Secretary General, we all consider ourselves feminists. Um, but as you all know, there are different ways of feminism, but, but there's also different ways of working towards what we could say is the same goal, and that is a gender equal, peaceful world. Uh, and, and then the question and then is, in, in what order do we do this, and with what actors do we work? Do we work inside the system that, that Christina highlights as, as flawed, so to speak, or do we work against the system? Do we work with military organizations or do we work outside them to influence them? And, and we all have our choices to make and I'm not going to, to judge anyone for, the, for their choices. I've made the choice to try and work inside and with these organizations to make, I, I think, smaller improvements and steps than, than than the ones Christina is highlighting when it comes to sort of dismantling the entire system. Uh, but I think we, but Christina is working hard on, her, on, on that end, so to speak, and together we are, we're all aiming for, for, this, for the same end result. And, and that's the important thing to, to keep in mind. So, so uh, if we, we work on all, all our different ends with different strategies, I think we, we all have really important roles to play. And, and uh, even though we might define uh, a, a feminist defense uh, strategy uh, differently, for example. Uh, so thank you about that. And sorry for not uh, jumping to the, to, the, to the actual question, Claire. No, that's OK. Thank you. Christina, uh, can, can I come back to you uh, uh, with, um, on the question about gender equality and linked to, um, uh, to budgeting? Mm -hmm. um, a quick remark before that as well, sure. um, uh, to, to, to Claire, um, to you Claire and Robert as well. Um, I fully agree and um, I also think that, and that is why I outlined those different steps um, and recommended this feminist task force within NATO to make those changes that changes um, can and should also come from within um, to trans like um, transform institutions that are built within a current system as well. 
Um, so I'm, I'm totally with you um, on that. Um, but, but also you're right um, that it's important um, that different actors are aware of the different roles and possibilities that they have and the focus um, that they're using. And so we can like all work um, together from different angles to come to that um, vision and utopia that we're all working for. Um, and regarding uh, gender equality and um, 2%, mm, I'm not sure if I understood that question correctly, but in, in any case, um, and I try to highlight that, um, it we, I mean, in, in a world with limited resources, be it um, personal resources or financial resources, we need to be aware that a spending on one thing means huge um, opportunity costs when it comes to other um, possibilities where money could be spent on. Um, and the uh, the statistics or the, the, the article that I mentioned before by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which they published during the pandemic and um, discussions during the pandemic on what we're spending money on and what keeps people actually secure shows that in our society, I think we have like a flawed understanding of priority when it comes to security. So there are billions being spent um, on, on weapons that, for example, but do not keep anyone secure, but then money is lacking for healthcare. And there's so many people in this world that do not have proper, proper healthcare. So when we talk about the 2% goal or when we talk about any money allocation, um, it is important, and um, a couple of you mentioned it before, to have this, I guess, feminist or gender analysis to understand how, like, how much does one euro, one dollar spent benefit different groups of society. Um, and this type of analysis needs to be put behind um, every budget. Thank, thanks for that, Christina. And uh, you raised up a, a question about priority. So maybe I'll come back to that in a little bit about uh, prioritization. But I have a question now for um, for the minister about um, how what is the long term plan to involve women in North Macedonia in roles in security more generally? If I could place that uh, to you, please. Uh well, hello. It's a it's a very interesting discussion. I was I was first uh, interested in joining uh, them, but uh, um, I I do acknowledge the importance of the question. Uh, our goal has been to promote more women in positions uh, in the Ministry of Defense and uh, in the Army, not because uh, their presence will ultimately you know change the lens through which we we look at security. But without their presence, the lens and the assessment will remain the same. And uh, it was a, a roller coaster, you know, on, on certain issues, uh, things ran smoothly. On certain issues, we have seen hiccups. Uh, and what I have experienced firsthand was uh, also this, uh, the, 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 the general um, trend that we see also in political parties uh, that uh, many of the fem excellent female candidates are extremely harsh at judging themselves uh, and their capacity upon getting a new job or a new position. And I'm still amazed at how, how critical they are, even though these discussions have been taking on taking place for, for more than 20 years. Uh, I will just name one example a few, few weeks ago uh, when I uh, uh, wanted to, to shift uh, a, a lady with excellent credentials uh, who was uh, a, a slightly lower ranking uh, uh, officer to a position which is very important. And uh, of course, uh, initially she was thrilled, but then she started having second thoughts. Uh, why? Because she felt that uh, she needed at least one extra rank. Of course, she completely forgot that just five years ago, uh, a lower ranking officer than herself was heading the department and managing her as well. But uh, trying to convince uh, young uh, female candidates to move forward quicker, to assume these positions, uh, requires a general change in the environment. And I think that uh, right now we have uh, passed the threshold because I think we visibly have a more diverse room whenever we have difficult discussions such as defense planning, budget, priorities, et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, I, I do believe that this will change uh, the reality. We have seen uh, positions that were never, ever um, uh, analyzed by, by women as an option now filled by women candidates. And out of three uh, young officers who went to great schools in the US, in the region, in the UK, uh, we have sent three of them that came back home with medals and with honors. Two of them were women. And today I had the opportunity to, to participate at the ceremony where one of them was actually honored by the Croatian army as being among the top three students in her class. So uh, I do believe that we need to put more emphasis on this just to encourage them. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think that even when we plan uh, the budget of the defense uh, ministry, we can have the gender lens on what kind of equipment, protective equipment for soldiers do we procure? What kind of uh, barracks do we develop? What kind of assistance and training uh, do we offer? And I, I really think that having more women at the table helped us fine tune some of these policies. This is of course not a breakthrough. You know, this will not change the reality in one, uh, in one uh, year, but it is definitely the element of a mosaic that will address both new security challenges, but also uh, more diversity in dealing with some of these challenges. Um, finally, let me say that I have been raised by a very strong mother and a very confident father. So I have lived uh, the first 20 years of my life believing that what I see around me is my country. And this is why I couldn't understand most of the discussions about gender roles and gender equality, because I was raised to feel as equal. I competed with men. I won most of the time. And I thought this is it. But actually the problem is to put ourselves in a position of uh, different types of women. And I, I, I really believe that this is what feminism should represent, that our life might not be representative of the life and the challenges that many women are, are uh, experiencing. And the fact that uh, the first woman who went to the uh, to, to a first woman who went for a mission in Afghanistan years ago was basically asked to cook coffee all the time by all of the officers and even same ranking uh, colleagues. So uh, putting our, our, our ourselves there and trying to 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 test the waters uh, on behalf of someone else and trying to help them in their uh, daily struggles. This is, uh, uh, I, I think, our daily challenge. If we want the resolution and, and uh, you know, women and peace and security to go beyond the document, because unlike our parents, you know, we live in time of political correctness, and that's great. We don't have to suffer the same problems that they have suffered, but sometimes the political politically correct approach becomes a bit boring, a bit formal, a bit irrelevant. And we, we tend to lose the enthusiasm of many young women and men uh, to join us in this struggle. So uh, I think we need to put more life into our efforts. Uh, and by this, we will, we will create more results. Thank you. So let me ask, just follow on with that and ask you the question, is it possible to have a feminist defense policy? I do believe that uh, feminist uh, foreign policy is uh, an option. I don't believe that the feminist uh, defense policy or foreign policy will, uh, will fit one box. But I, I generally believe that in order for our foreign and defense policy to work, it has to have feminism as one of the elements. And uh, uh, I have seen the role of some of my colleagues uh, in government, uh, some of my, my colleagues in parliament as well, because we have seen a significant increase of women uh, in parliament in the course of the last 10 years. I have seen their influence as uh, uh, a key in changing the perception. But uh, what I think uh, feminists agree on is that uh, uh, we believe uh, in different paths, but we do have one value in common, and this is our right uh, to, to participate, our right to contribute, our right to be loud, 
and our right to be heard. Thank you. I agree. Um, so I'm going to go to another question now. Thank you for that. Um, and the question is, uh, is actually coming from inside NATO. And this is, what is the most overlooked lesson of the past 20 years? And how can we use that to improve in the future? And I'm going to start again. Robert, if I can start with you, and then we'll, we'll take something from each of the panelists. It's a really difficult question. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we haven't even gotten the, the, the lesson that is trying that has tried to be addressed in, in, in resolution 1325. I mean the, even the basics. So, so in, but in terms of uh, implementation, uh, I think perhaps there has been a little bit too much focus on representation uh, rather than uh, inclusive, gender equal organizations uh, where, where all members work towards the same goals, so to speak. Uh, that, that, that would be one uh, challenge. And, and yeah, I'll stop there and, and let the others address this as well. Great. Thank you. Christina, what, what do you think are the overlooked lessons? Or are there lessons? Um, so what's been overlooked? Um... I, I briefly mentioned that before, and that's what um, some of the, the mothers and like big thinkers around the um, agenda also say is definitely prevention. Um, so because prevention as it um, was intended um, was the prevention of conflict um, and like living in this utopian, a peaceful world. And then prevention too often has been turned into preventing sexualized violence, for example. So making women safer within an unsafe environment. Um, and that is a problem and it was never intended to be that case. So a focus on proper prevention. And then I believe, and my organization believes that again, then goes back to how societies have been built and who has power and who has access. Um, when we really talk about achieving sustainable peace and peaceful um, 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 world, we need to ask the system questions um, and it's difficult and it's painful, but we won't get there any other way. Um, and I think, um, so we, here in Germany, for example, we were, we are part of the, the group around 30 and 25. And as the German government is currently preparing its third national action plan a few months ago, um, together with other feminist organizations here, we published a policy brief with our demands for the next national action plan. Um, and part of that is also um, the, the need to look internally. So because, as you all know, there's this tendency that countries from the global north, global north um, focus their naps on countries in global south, and global south countries look more internally. But countries in global north, um, they shouldn't think that they're doing everything right, but they have to look um, internally as well. And then continue to always update the understanding of security and safety with recent developments. And one that's been increasing massively over the past couple of years, I mean, already since um, Beijing, but especially over the um, past four or five years, is the, the attacks and the threats and the violence from right-wing extremists and populists and authoritarian leaders with, who at their core have an anti-feminist and women-hating um, agenda. So um, for a women, peace and security agenda to stay on top and updated, um, it needs to include such new threats more and more as well, and be outspoken against populism and the international pushback on, on human rights and, and right-wing extremism. Wait, can I just quickly follow on that? Uh, because I agree with you absolutely about prevention. I think that is one of the overlooked parts of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And I also think it's one of the areas that is so critical. How does somebody, how does an organization like NATO look at prevention what what, are, what is the linkage there how they do or how they should both <laughs> give us the should thank you um with the should um i i still believe it um it's um really tackling um the systems and you can only prevent conflict if you change institutions and systems and for nato to make sure we live, we prevent conflicts and live in a sustainable, in a world with sustainable peace. Um, what NATO can do is what I outlined before regarding nuclear policy and the idea of domination and violence, 
but really um, um, focus more on the political organization bit. And, and what, for example, what I mentioned before as well was that a feminist defense policy, the idea, the utopia of feminist defense policy must be based on cooperation. Um, and with regards to the big threats such as pandemic and um, cl climate crisis and so forth. And that is something um, an organization like NATO could easily uh, stronger, uh, stronger prioritize, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. I'm going to ask uh, uh, the minister, uh, what about uh, uh, the overlooked elements of 1325 or the WIMPY security agenda altogether? What have we missed? Um, I, I just want to, to mention what I think was an overlooked success. Not overlooked, but uh, from time to time forgotten. I don't believe that we have dealt with the problem of harassment and violence within our militaries but definitely the situation is uh, much better than it was 20 years ago, not to mention before. I do believe that the measures that have been taken by majority NATO member states, uh, including our own, to prevent harassment, to, to create a system in which intimidation is not welcome or, and it is punishable, I think that this is one of the overlooked successes. Maybe we don't want to say that it was a, 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 full, a full success because yet uh, needs to be done. But generally speaking, I think that this is one of the big pluses. And I fully agree that the overlooked danger that I see in many of our societies is the uh, influence, uh, the growing influence of autocratic populists. And uh, uh, it is clear that this populism is a result of a certain kind of cultural backlash uh, against the long-term process of cultural change. And this cultural change is very much visible in the gender domain. And this is why you will see among all of these populists, not only in our region, in the Balkans, but also in Europe, you will see a very, very strong uh, misogynist uh, tone. Uh, and uh, just one word on NATO prevention. Uh, I have in mind some of our experiences years ago with the NATO mission in Macedonia, uh, and uh, also with regards to the NATO mission in Kosovo. And I think that a lot was done uh, on post-conflict prevention in a way of further hostilities. And I think that the cooperation between NATO and EU was a very successful formula because uh, EU really dealt more directly with the institutions. NATO dealt more with the reforms of the security forces but just the sheer presence of NATO forces allowed citizens to have confidence that the process might be successful. So it's not a safe bet always, but it definitely contributes to confidence building measures. Thank you for that. And you've raised a very important point about uh, partnerships, about partnerships in, in small p in terms of international organizations and with others. And this brings me to the question on where do men fit in this? Uh, so I'm going to go to Robert about what do we do about men and masculinities? Yeah, with, with a bit of extra thinking time, I, I thought that, would, that was also one of the things I would like to highlight as somewhat overlooked, that a, because a gender equal, peaceful society needs to address both genders and 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 and, so we have to ask these questions about men and masculinity as well and, and problematize them. And we really haven't gone into that. And it's perfectly understandable because it goes to the very heart of male identity, of military identity. It really hurts to question who you are and your deep down sort of beliefs about what it means to be a man. Uh, uh, but, but that is something we have to talk about more. Uh, and that also means engaging men. Uh, this cannot be uh, a, a women's agenda uh, to promote increased women's representation. We really have to address men and masculinity and, and how men can make a contribution towards these goals just as well as women. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we, have a, we only have five or six minutes left. And fortunately, I think we could talk for a very long time. I want to then say, uh, just open to any closing thoughts about what is the future? And if I pose the question, then what is women, peace and security? And what is its future? And I'll go to you, Christine, if I can first. Okay. Um, so I guess for the future of women, peace and security, it would be important for us to go back to its origins. Um, 
Oh, um, do we? Can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Yes. Something yes, just yes. popped up here. Okay, okay cool. Um, to go back um, to the origins of women, peace, and security, and if you um, 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 read about the kind of the stories about how women, peace, and security, the resolution 20 years ago, happened um, by, for example, Zanam and Alini and others, um, they, they are very outspoken about the fact that we talked about prevention. Prevention was a huge part, but also disarmament, for example. Um, and during the negotiations, these are things that were cut out um, because these are the difficult conversations. Um, so for the future of women, peace and security, we need, we need to make sure that we keep the kind of the radical, whatever radical is radical, actually only means like going to the roots, like going to the roots, feminist ideas in mind, what it was actually about. Um, so for, um, we, we need to talk about right-wing extremism and colonialism and racism and our whole, about all, about how all these things play out um, these days in international policy making. Um, and I think this is the best way to honor the resolution um, and to make sure it's it's not getting co-opted by 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 anyone by any country by any institution, um, but keeps its transformational momentum that um, it was supposed to have. And um, yeah, it's I guess I would like to encourage everyone who has any power to influence policymaking to really be willing and open to look at pain points and. Um, and those conversations that hurt, and Robert just mentioned masculinities, and that is one, and disarmament is one, and nuclear prol proliferation is one, and um, and all of those, because actual change for better societies um, and secure societies only happens if people are willing to question their own power and also give a power. Thank you, Christina. Can I can I turn to Minister Shakurinska, please, for some thoughts on what is WIMP, peace and security, and where is our future? Uh. Just uh, two comments. Uh, first, I, I think the future is looking more within uh, and uh, looking for uh, the vulnerabilities in our societies, not just the risks on the border and the uh, front line far away from us, looking at the vulnerabilities of our democratic uh, fiber. Uh, and uh, the second uh, comment is definitely uh, analyzing the, the cyber consequences or the, let's say the cyber footprint of uh, women in peace and security. Someone mentioned the increase of violence uh, uh, towards uh, jur women journalists, uh, civil society activists. We have seen a huge increase in violence, not only physical, but very much uh, violence on social media, which incites violence in our societies. And this violence especially hurts women. And it especially hurts women who are in the front line, in the security front line, in the political front line, in, in, in uh, even in pacifist movements front line. Uh, and I think that this will have long term effects. And I think it is time that within the VPS format, uh, we, we look at these things. But uh, if this is the two new threats or two new things that we need to, to bring back to, to women in peace and security, I still believe that participation is important for maintaining gender's perspective. Uh, and uh, I have seen it in all the forums that I've worked that numbers mattered. Uh, and uh, I, I do hope that this will continue to be, to be uh, a goal. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And Robert, uh, Women, Peace and Security, what's the future? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to acknowledge the fact that we, for some reason, we, in the early 21st century, we found ourselves in, in a new era of, of, of strong men. Uh, and, I, it's, and, and that's a, a break in history where we have moved towards greater openness, democracy, uh, improvement of human rights and of, of women's rights. And that is really challenging. That goes straight against this agenda. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are moving forward on, on this agenda as well, uh, and I'm 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 an optimist uh, in that. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, what I hope at least what we're seeing is the, the sort of the final defense of the traditional uh, order, uh, 
but I'm also hopeful because I'm seeing transformation in people who engage with these issues that the, the real resistance comes from people who have very little experience working with women or understanding gender perspectives on issues. And once they do, and especially men and middle-aged men, there, there's, a, there's a fantastic transformation process taking place. Uh, and I, I'd say I'm, 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 I'm myself part of that process. And I think the Secretary General has also gone through a tremendous process. And, and there are many among us who, when we engage these issues, are transformed. And, and that means it seems to be history is on our side in that the transformation process is, is going in that direction. There are very few people who have advanced feminism and gender issues who have suddenly stepped back in the opposite direction. Uh, so, so we're moving, transformation is in the right direction. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future and the increasing importance of these issues in, in future security and defense debates. Well, thank you to you all. This is, uh, and I want to echo Christina's words, we need to have these difficult conversations because this is where 1325 and the Sisterhood of the Resolutions came out of, was having the difficult conversation about what was missing. And, uh, and I thank all of our panellists. I thank you all for being here and for that difficult conversation. Thank you, Christina, for pushing us. Um, and thank you for, to you all because we, to get to transformation, I do believe we have to have these conversations and we have to bring in those who are not necessarily on the same page so that we can find somewhere in the middle so we can advance. Absolutely, this agenda is about transformation. This is not a woman's agenda. Um, and, and, I'm, and, the, and the key takeaways for me were the words transformation from within. Because as well, we in NATO are looking at how do we change and adapt to the future? How do we change with this agenda? And I do believe the agenda has to change as well. I do believe it has to be fit for purpose for everyone. And that we get out of silo mentality, a fragmentation of this agenda. Because in the end, the ultimate goal for all of us is about gender equality. However we see that ideologically or however we see that practically. Um, I believe Wimpy's security is the future, and how we advance it, to me, is the question. And I don't think we can wait another 20 years. Uh, we need to march on very quickly. Time waits for no woman. Uh, and we need to use this moment. We need to m use this moment to push for the change and to really build on what we have all achieved uh, and to be positive, as you said, Robert, about the future. As the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, Real change, enduring change happens one step at a time, but I think gender equality needs one giant leap for womankind. And I think we should all leap together towards that. Thank you so very, very much. I appreciate your time and I appreciate this conversation. I only wish it could be longer. And so on behalf of NATO, thank you very much. And I wish you all a wonderful evening, afternoon, and be safe wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.